in the second Timothy one, we have a very interesting text that we encounter that has to do with a friend of St. Paul by the name of Anisiphorus. Now, this text very often does get brought up in discussion when talking about prayer for the dead. And, you know, perhaps we should read the text before even telling you what the main debate is. Second Timothy 1 begins with, Hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me, in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are the jealous and hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So there's the, the desire to grant mercy. Uh, currently, he wants mercy at that moment in time to be granted the household of Anisiphorus. That's very clear. And then to grant mercy to him on that day. It very, really does seem to us like Anisiphorus is no longer presently with, with us in the mind of St. Paul as he writes this letter out. Now, are Protestant exegetes, perhaps, uh, do they differ when it comes to how they interpret this passage? Yeah, they do. But a good chunk of some of the very top ones seem to think that Anisiphorus is dead. That's quite fascinating. Now, when it comes to commentaries in 2 Timothy, there really are not a whole lot either. So it's not like you can go to, the, to a plethora of patristic commentaries on this particular text and say, we're going to solve the issue that way. But we do have one very prominent commentary on 2 Timothy that we think we can solve this issue as to whether or not Anisiphorus was alive or dead. But we do want to read it again because, again, it really does seem to us like Anisiphorus isn't with us anymore. Look at what he says. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord on that day. So may he find mercy on that day. But he is hoping for the Lord to grant mercy presently to the household of Anisiphorus. Why not say to him as well, since he was so kind and loving to St. Paul, really does seem to us that Anisiphorus is no longer with us. Was he martyred? What happened? Uh, we are aware that multiple early traditions have what they, certain things that they believe about Anisiphorus. We're not going to get into that today. Our desire is to simply look at the text, look at the Greek, then look at perhaps one of the greatest Greek fathers ever, and to discuss and perhaps come to the conclusion as to what was the status of Anisiphorus. Now, again, we spoke about how there are multiple scholars that have certain things to say about this figure, Anisiphorus, and of course, we recognize that Protestants seem to be divided as to the status of this guy, oh, this saint, this enigmatic figure. But the text is very clear. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. Oh, that is quite uh, important because Anisiphorus doesn't seem to be with us anymore. That's tough to really get around that if you're going to try and argue that Anisiphorus is still alive. Really, from the text, from what we're able to extrapolate from this text, it doesn't seem like he's still with us anymore. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, no friend of Catholicism, in the entry on Anisiphorus says, he also uses these words in regards to Anisiphorus himself. The Lord grant unto him to find mercy of the Lord 
in that day, it is not clear whether Anisiphorus was living or whether he had died before Paul wrote this epistle. Different opinions have been held on this subject. So there you go. At least the scholarship here, the International Standard Bible, shows us that there are different opinions held on this subject, that scholars vary as to whether or not they believe Anisiphorus was alive or dead. But John Rutherford goes onward to note the way in which Paul refers twice to the household, this is very important, very important, of Anisiphorus makes it possible that Anisiphorus himself had died. That really is the likeliest interpretation. That's exactly why Rutherford puts that forth. He notes that the household is referred to multiple times. It, it really does seem to us that he's not with us anymore. So Rutherford will note, it does make it possible. Now, he doesn't want to be dogmatic about this, uh, but then he goes on to say, if this is so, but certainly, but certainty is impossible. So he says, okay, well, it's possible, but, you know, we can't be exactly certain. Well, that's fine. You know, we'll take that from you. You know, we'll take that. Uh, at least you show that scholarship says that that's a possibility. And you say it is possible, but we can't be certain. But of course, now the anti-Catholicism comes out. The apostles' words in regard to him would be a pious wish. So let me tell you one thing. If I say, may the Lord grant mercy, uh, whether you want to call it a wish or not, uh, that wish is definitely your desire that he has mercy from the Lord in that day. And if you call out to the Lord, if you ask the Lord for something such as hoping the Lord grant him mercy, that pious wish is a prayer. No matter what, no matter which way you want to cut it, that's a prayer. He is praying, he's desiring that he have mercy on that day, which has nothing in common with the abuses which have gathered around the subject of prayers for the dead, a practice which has no foundation in Scripture. Now, for Rutherford to say that, Rutherford very clearly believes that 2 Maccabees, which 2 Maccabees chapter 12 very clearly does refer to prayer. Uh, he doesn't believe it to be canonical, believes it to be apocryphal. That's a huge problem because Scripture, which quotes from the Maccabean text and the early church, are very, very clear that the, the Maccabean books uh, first and second Maccabees were part of the canon of scripture from the very beginning in terms of every single time the church gathered at council to discuss the contents of the Old Testament. First and second Maccabees are never lacking. So Rutherford is definitely has a problem there with the history of the Bible. The word pictures in the New Testament from Greek scholar A.T. Robertson. Now, this is a Greek scholar. <laughs> this is no slouch, right? A top Greek scholar. Verse 16, grant mercy. The phrase nowhere else in the New, in the New Testament, sec aorist active optative of didon. So this is important. Very, very important. Because then he goes onward to note the usual form being doe, doe, a. This is a usual construction in a wish about the future. Unto the house of Anisiphorus. The same phrase in 2 Timothy 4.19. Apparently, Anisiphorus is now dead, as is implied by the wish in 2 Timothy 1.18. Do you catch that? Apparently, Anisiphorus is now dead. So A.T. Robertson, a top Greek scholar, has no problem telling us Anisiphorus is dead. He's no longer with the living, for he oft refresh me. First aorist, active indicative, old verb, to cool again in the Septuagint and Koine, often, here only in the New Testament, found in Acts 3.20. In the first imprisonment or the second, if he lost his life for coming to see Paul, it was probably recently during this imprisonment, was not ashamed of my chain, passive deponent again, with accusative as in 2 Timothy 1.8. So uh, A.T. Robertson, top Greek scholar, has no problem telling us Anisiphorus is dead. He tells you right here. <laughs> there really is no doubt about it. Apparently, Anisiphorus is now dead. But we now encounter the golden mouthman, the incredible St. John Chrysostomus, who 
does provide a commentary on 2 Timothy, and in particular touches upon this text, but there really is a lot we have to unravel, because it really isn't clear exactly what St. John Chrysostom is saying if we only zero in on little tiny portions, because I've had discussions before with people that say, well, you know what, we need to really unpack all of it because it really isn't entirely clear what St. John Chrysostom is trying to say. Well, I think it does become abundantly clear once we really do unpack it all. St. John Chrysostom notes, such ought the faithful to be, neither fear nor threats nor disgrace should deter them from assisting one another, standing by them and securing them as in war. For they do not so much benefit those who are in danger as themselves by the service they render to them, making themselves partakers of the crowns due to them. Look at that. Look at all of the language of crowns, of partakers, and what have you. For example, is any one of those who are devoted to God, visited with affliction and distress, and maintaining the conflict with great fortitude, while you are not yet brought to this conflict, it is in your power, if you will, without entering into the course, to be a sharer of the crowns reserved for him. So you're going to be a sharer in the crowns by standing by him, preparing his mind and animating and exciting him. Hence it is that Paul elsewhere says, you have done well that you did communicate with my affliction. For even in Thessalonica, you sent me once again unto my necessity. And how could they that were far off share in the affliction of him that was not with them? How? He says, you send once and again unto my necessities. Again, he says, speaking of Epaphroditus, because he was near unto death, not regarding his life, that he might supply your lack of service toward me. For as in the service of kings, not only those who fight the battle, but those who guard the baggage share in the honor. And not merely so, but frequently even have an equal portion of the spoils, though they have not imbued their hands in blood nor stood in array, nor even seen the ranks of the enemy. So it is in these conflicts. For he who relieves a combatant, when wasted with hunger, who stands by him, encouraging him by words and rendering him every service, he is not inferior to the combatant. For do not suppose Paul the combatant, that irresistible and invincible one, but some one of the many who, if he had not received much consolation and encouragement, would not perhaps have stood, would not have contended. So those who are out of the contest may perchance be the cause of victory to him, who's engaged in it, and may be partakers of the crowns reserved for the victor. Now, what kind of a crown is reserved for the victor? Now, he's utilizing the language of St. Paul, who speaks of that crown over and over. Now, the crown is salvation, of course. That is important. The Bible speaks of your crown as being clearly your reward in heaven. You are saved. You are crowned in glory in heaven. And what wonder if he who communicates to the living is thought worthy of the same rewards with those who contend, since it is possible to communicate after death, even with the departed, with those who are asleep, who are already crowned, who want for nothing, for here, Paul's saying, partaking in the memories of the saints. And how may this be done? When you admire a man, buildest his monument. When you do any of those acts for which he was crowned, you're evidently a sharer in his labors and in his crowns. Keep in mind what St. Paul has in mind here. So we keep all of this in mind when looking at the great St. John Chrysostomos, what is he talking about? What is the message being conveyed? That really is at the heart and center of what we are looking at. So right here, we're going to go over it again. So those who are out of the contest may perchance be the cause of victory to him who is engaged in it and may be partakers of the crowns reserved for the victor. And what wonder? If he who communicates to the living is thought worthy of the same rewards with those who contend, since it is possible to communicate even after death with the departed, with those who are asleep, who are already crowned, who want for nothing. For here, Paul's saying, partaking in the memories of the saints, and how may this be done? When you admire a man, buildest his monument. 
When you do any of those acts for which he was crowned, you are evidently a sharer in his labors and in his crowns. We go onward. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. I want you to be clear. I want to be clear in one thing. I am quoting all of this, beginning of where I begun, everything in direct order. I'm not cutting and pasting out of order. It's all in order in order to show you the context. After talking about prayer for the dead, the departed, he says, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. He had compassion on me, in reference to Anisiphorus. He says, he shall therefore have the like return in that terrible day, referring to the day of judgment. When we shall have need of such mercy, the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord. Are there two lords? Then? By no means. But to us, there is one Lord, Christ Jesus, and one God. Here, those who are infected with the heresy of Marcion assail this expression. But let them learn that this mode of speech is not uncommon in Scripture. As when it is said, the Lord said to my Lord, and again I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, and the Lord rained fire from the Lord. This indicates that the persons are of the same substance. Not that there is a distinction of nature, for we are not to understand that there are two substances differing from each other, but two persons each being of the same substance. This is so important. This is a masterful Christological point by the great Saint John Chrysostomus. What is this Christological point? That, look at this, we are not to understand that there are two substances, meaning, guess what? There is only one true God. There are two persons, though. Now, of course, he's referring to the Father and the Son. There are three persons in the Godhead. So this is a masterful Christological point being made here by the golden-mouthed one. He goes onward. Observe, too, that he says, the Lord grant him mercy. For as he himself has obtained mercy from Anisiphorus, he wished him to obtain the same from God, moral. And if Anisiphorus, who exposed himself to danger, is saved by mercy, much more are we also saved by the same. So this is important. He's referring to Anisiphorus, who... Is he wants them to be saved by mercy on that day. All of the language is indicative of Anisiphorus no longer being with us. He's no longer alive. For terrible indeed, terrible is that account, and such as needs great love for mankind that we may not hear that awful sentence. Depart from me, I never knew you. You that work iniquity or that fearful word. Now let's pause for a moment. Because all of this is in the context of judgment day that it, there be mercy given to Anisiphorus. Very clearly, he's before this. Remember, before we get to talking about Anisiphorus, I want to remind you, where is that? Before we even get there, I want to remind you, just rewind a little bit in the same, same chapter, same context, same work. He begins saying, do not suppose Paul the combatant, that irresistible, invincible one, some one of the many who, if he had not received much consolation and encouragement, would not perhaps have stood, would not have contended. So those who are out of the contest may perchance be the cause of victory to him, who is engaged in it and may be partakers of the crowns reserved for the victor. Look at this. What wonder if he who communicates to the living is thought worthy of the same rewards with those who contend, since it is possible to communicate after death. So you can communicate after death death and right after talking about the crowns that he wishes that they get after talking about though he wishes people receive the crowns that are present with the saints in heaven he then moves on to anisiphorus the lord grant unto him that he find mercy of the lord in that day clearly is referring to the hope that he will have mercy upon his soul in the afterlife that is the context here Look at what he says. If Anisiphorus, who exposed himself to danger, is saved by mercy, much more are we also saved by the same. So he's talking about how we desire to be saved by mercy and on that day, on Judgment Day. But he goes forward to then talk about 
all things in the context of judgment. Hoping for Anisiphorus for there to be mercy for Anisiphorus. But look at all of the judgment language being used. Indicative of one that is dead. Some will receive their crowns. Some will be accursed. Which is why he hopes for the mercy to be upon the soul of Anisiphorus. Depart, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels that we may not hear. Between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed that we may not hear that voice full of horror. Take them away and cast them into outer darkness that we may not hear those words full of terror. Thou wicked and slothful servant. So talking about how one that is dead may hear these words and they're horrible, horrifying words. Words indicative of one not being saved. But he hopes that there be mercy for Anisiphorus. Look at that. Let's look at what he says. If Anisiphorus, who exposed himself to danger, is saved by mercy, much more are also we saved by the same. So he's hoping that there be mercy, that Anisiphorus be saved by mercy. Now, if Anisiphorus were still alive, he wouldn't be in the context of those that are dead with the hope of being saved by mercy, that wouldn't be in the context of what St. John Chrysostom is talking about. But St. John Chrysostom need not say, hey, Anisiphorus is dead, in order for you to realize that he's talking about him being dead. That is why he says that if Anisiphorus who exposes himself to danger is saved by mercy, much more are we also saved by the same. And then he goes on to talk about the horrors of Judgment Day. The horrors of Judgment Day. It truly is magnificent. And it truly, it tends to get glossed over when we read this commentary. It tends to just get totally looked over. But look at what he says. For awful, truly, and terrible is that tri tribunal. The tribunal. And yet God is gracious and merciful. He is called a God of mercies and a God of comfort. Good as none else is good and kind and gentle and full of pity. Who wills not the death of a sinner, but that he should be converted and live. Does this any wonder why some of the top Greek Protestant scholars believe Anisiphorus is dead in the epistle? St. John Chrysostom believes he's dead as well. Multiple Protestant exegetes believe he's dead. Now, if he's dead, then what is going on here? Is this an evidence of prayer for the dead? Is this an evidence of purgatory? Because if we can come to the conclusion that Anisiphorus is dead, which by all accounts and purposes, it seems like he is dead, what's going on here then? So we go onward to read. This is important. Important to read pretty much everything to the end. Whence then, when is that day so full of agony and anguish? A stream of fire is rolling before his face. The books of our deeds are open. The day itself is burning as an oven. The angels are flying around and many furnaces are prepared. How then is he good and merciful and full of loving kindness to man? Even herein he is merciful. And he shows in these things the greatness of his loving kindness. For he holds forth to us these terrors that being constrained by them, we may be awakened to the desire of the kingdom. That is incredible language. Truly incredible. So what is our conclusion? Do we agree? Do we agree with A.T. Robertson where he says, Apparently, Anisiphorus is now dead, as is implied by the wish. Well, I argue, and I think very clearly this is a prayer, because if you hope and desire the Lord have mercy on someone, and you ask the Lord have mercy on someone, you are asking of something, you are petitioning something, you are praying. Anytime you call out to the Lord, in any way, that is a prayer. Now, is this evidence of purgatory? I don't think so. Now, do I think St. Paul teaches purgatory? Without a doubt in 1 Corinthians 3. It's also taught in 2 Maccabees and various other places of the Bible. Just don't think this particular area, 
I don't think it's even on his mind. He's just hoping for there to be mercy, for Anisiphorus on Judgment Day. Now, is it possible he has in mind that Anisiphorus might need purification? It's never mentioned. We've got to stick to what we've got there in the text before our very eyes. In the Greek, we've got to stick to what's there. We have to stick to what is there. And sticking strictly to the text, it very clearly seems to us that Anisiphorus is dead. And this is a prayer, a hope, and a wish. That the Lord have mercy. On an now, it, it, it really is important because the desire of mercy. Now, here's the important thing. If an were still alive, as scholars have pointed out, likely he wouldn't be careful to ask for mercy to the household of an presently, and then mercy from the Lord on that day. So very clearly, he, he doesn't believe he's part of his household anymore. Thus, he asks for mercy for the household of Anisiphorus, and then mercy from the Lord on that day. Notice how we've got two different things there. So he, he really seems to no longer be part of the household anymore, yet there is a hope that there be mercy extended to him. And that is a hope that we should have really for anyone. And really, that is a wonderful and a beautiful kind of a hope. And it, it isn't outlandish that even some Protestant scholars believe that Anisiphorus is, is dead here. He's no longer alive. <laughs> now, we could have reproduced more. There are more Protestant commentaries. There are indeed more. There, um, you can find the the West word studies in the Greek New Testament, which tells us the household of Anisiphorus is greeted. It is natural to suppose that he was dead. So that's another Greek scholarly work, West word studies in the Greek New Testament. And it references that it isn't the only one, the other Greek scholarly source A.T. Robertson, who's a Greek scholar, it notes, is also on the same page. So there are multiple scholarly references, not only Catholic saying here that Anisiphorus is dead. So I think that we can logically come to the conclusion Anisiphorus is dead. St. John Chrysostom points to that. Greek scholars point to that. So if he's dead, what's happening? That's where we need to go to then. If he's dead, what's going on? The Lord granted him that he find mercy from the Lord in that day. He's asking the Lord for something. He's asking the Lord to grant mercy to Anisiphorus. You don't need for him to say, hey, I'm praying, I'm down on my knees. No, he's praying that there be mercy from the Lord on that day. And if he's dead, this is prayer, that there be mercy for a dead man. I mean... I don't know what you want me to say. So there's evidence of purgatory in 1 Corinthians 3. There's evidence of prayer for the dead here. And these are in the proto-canonical New Testament texts. I mean, this is abundantly clear. He's dead. St. Paul is praying for him. Let's not try to make anything more out of it, though. Such as, well, he believes he's suffering in purgatory, needs prayer through purification. It's not there present in the text. But it's not an indictment against the doctrine of purgatory, because St. Paul very clearly taught strong belief in the doctrine of purgatory. But we believe that all of the evidence we've laid out, all of the evidence that we've laid out, very clearly does point to the Catholic interpretation of 2 Timothy. And if it does, now you want to really emphasize, if this does point to the Catholic interpretation, well, then you've got a New Testament reference that points to prayer for the dead. If there's baptism for the dead, which we'll do a video on that later, you know, what's going on with prayer for the dead here? So, <clears throat> all of this is incredibly fascinating. How the more and more you dig it into the biblical text, and you look at the biblical evidence, you find that 
The idea of praying for the dead in 2 Maccabees 12, that the Jews believed in, was not an outlandish thing. And that is why, from the very beginning, from the earliest of times, the early church fathers believed in prayer for the dead. They believed in prayer for their departed. It is my hope that you've been edified. If you've been edified by this video, if you like our videos that we've been putting out lately, if you've been edified, smash a like, consider becoming a patron to help support us. Your incredible support is the way that we're able to write books. If you like the books we do, if you like the debates we partake in, consider becoming a member of the channel or Patreon. You will get access to tons of scholarly courses that are not available otherwise. At the very least, if you say, William, I want to support you, the best way I can do it is through prayer. I can tell you right now that I will take every prayer that I can get. And I hope that you remember me in your prayers. I am praying for you. And I hope you pray for me during this incredible Lenten season that we're going through. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.